Greetings, programs. This is Wretch. Welcome back to Shadowrun Hong Kong. Still feeling bad about Reliable Matthew, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and talk to the rest of the crew. You enter to find Wu stalking the floor silently, one hand held rigidly near his hip, the other flexing and unflexing again and again. When he notices you, he nods once and goes back to his caged panther routine. You're going to wear a hole in the floor that way. Wu keeps pacing. Need something? Hmm. Yeah, the drink. Looks like you could use one too. I hear Club 88 has two for ones between four and six o'clock, but you'll have to drink them both. I don't put drugs or alcohol into my body. Hmm. Any more, you mean? You don't put crap into your body anymore. That's right. I'll own that. Any more. I don't need my judgment impaired like that anymore. We both know what can happen when I drink. Duncan is grumpy right now. Been thinking about Josephine Sang, what she did to our family, what she did to Carter. His pace increases a bit and his tusk jut forward slightly. Josephine Sang. Damned Josephine Sang. Hmm. We'll find a way to get her, Duncan. Good, because when we do... The old Duncan is coming out and play. Wu's eyes smolder. Here's what we do. We walk into Sang headquarters and ask for the boss. When she comes down, we grab her, take her somewhere quiet, and ask her why she had Carter and those runners killed. Find out what happened to Raymond, whether he's alive or dead. What happens next is up to her. Hmm. Kidnap a member of the Hong Kong Executive Council while there's an APB out on us? It's bold. They'll never see it coming. This is the way to go. My way. Now, where have I heard that before? What? My way? That's right. There's one way this is going to go. He catches himself. Understanding appears in his eyes. Oh, crap. That's what Ray used to say. Raymond Black, our benevolent dictator. No question his rules, no falling short of his expectations. It was his way or the wrong way. Hmm. Or you get the full-on Raymond treatment. I didn't care to be on the receiving end of that. And I was more than once, that's for sure. You remember what happened a few years ago after we moved out of the squad and into his house? The thing with Double Tray and Lockjaw when he accused us of relapsing back into our old ways? Man. That was when Ray's authority finally got tested. His raspy baritone is tinged with satisfaction. When I finally stood up to him. Hmm. Well, let's see here. There's, there's just different ways that this can go. He couldn't hear a word you were saying. I'd never seen him so angry. It was a sight to behold, that's for sure. I didn't listen, he didn't listen, and then we butted heads, same as always. He smiles, but it's filled with regret. But that was one of the worst. Good thing you were there to stop it. His face settles into an expression of resignation. Okay, Mr. Sean, we don't need to do things my way. No need for us to butt heads. He stretches, and you can hear his joints crack. And on that note, I'm going to have to ask you to clear out. It's been another long day. Hmm. I'm getting the feeling they're all going to be long days. Yeah, I'm getting that feeling too. Anyway, have a good night, Caleb. I'll catch you tomorrow. Okay, so... We stopped Wu from doing something somewhat rash. Let's see what the rest have to say. I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to get anything out of Isobel until we do her mission. Let's chat with Ractor. Ractor's shop is curiously silent. As you step down onto the grated metal floor, the sound of your own footsteps reverberates through the echo chamber of the converted engine room. Oh, welcome back, my friend. He leans against his desk. Is there something that I can do for you? Quiet night in the shop, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, a quiet night. He takes a drag on his cigarette. One best suited for contemplation, planning, and visions of the future. Any thoughts on that last run? 
I find the notion of key mechanics, the underlying science behind the flow of magically determined fortune, to be quite fascinating. If only I could perceive the ebb and flow of such forces, I imagine that it would be incredible, like observing the underlying force of the universe. But alas, such things are beyond the reach of the unawakened. Sorry, state of affairs. I'm surprised that you buy into Hong Kong's obsession with feng shui. Uh, no, my friend, not feng shui. Key mechanics. Feng shui is rooted in ancient superstition. Yes, its practitioners have enjoyed some success at redirecting the flow of good fortune, but this should not be mistaken for evidence that their beliefs are correct. After all, an apothecary might brew up a tonic to treat an outbreak of flu, but that does not mean that he understands why the tonic works. I want to know why Qi works the way it does, and to strip away the superstitious underpinnings that hold Feng Shui back. But of course, I cannot. I can't even see the key in question, let alone record my observations. I will have to leave the topic for others who are better suited to study it. Now, what else would you have of me? Care to pick up where we left off last time? His smile widens. Light gleams off a strong, sharp teeth, lending him a predatory appearance. If you like. I must confess, I have rather enjoyed our talks. It is good to have a sounding board to bounce ideas off of. Hmm. Agreed. Our talks have been pleasant, in an academic sense. Glad to hear that we're on the same page. He takes a drag on his cigarette. I must confess, I am sometimes forget how to interact with others. I am, by nature, a solitary creature. It is good to have a kindred spirit, someone whom I can understand on the team. Koshi scuttles forward, mechanical pedipalps weaving. Its motions are as alien and charged with menace as they've ever been. Ractor glances at the machine, and it takes a step back. He claps his hands together and rubs them briskly. So, my friend, you had questions for me. Go ahead and ask them, please. I'll answer whatever I can. Hmm. You said that you sometimes forget how to interact with other people? That makes perfect sense concerning his personality. An idiosyncrasy of mine, I suppose. When I get lost in my own head, relating to others becomes difficult. He smiles apologetically. It's nothing personal, just a quirk that I occasionally struggle to hide. Hmm. Well, you're doing a pretty good job of it. You've always been friendly with me. Ah, but when you come down here, we talk about things that are relevant to my interest. That makes it easier. In any case, thank you. Your kindness is appreciated. Well, the last time we talked, you hinted at Koshi being special in some way. I want to hear the full story. Yes, I had figured that you might. Tell me, have you noticed anything unusual about Koshi in the time that we have worked together? Hmm. This is true. He seems to react to your moods. It's weird, he's almost more like an animal than he is a drone. He nods, his lips pursed. Yes, a good observation. Koshi's behavior could be described as animalistic, and for good reason. I bet he put an animal in here somehow. I'm waiting. The drone lowers itself, its killing legs splayed. Ractor looks to the drone, his head cocked, then he returns his gaze to you. His behavior is not drone-like because he is not the drone, at least not in the way that you would understand. He is a prosthesis. Whoa, what is he meant to replace? Uh, he isn't meant to replace anything, but he does contain a portion of me, as surely as your brain sits within your skull. We are, in a way, a singular entity in two bodies, metal and flesh made one. Hmm. You're going to have to explain that. Koshi acts as a home for my primal animal impulses. The ID to use Freud's structural model of the psyche. The analytical portions of my mind, the ego and superego, live on in me. They govern the id, and by extension, Koshi's behavior. When we are on a run and I rig into Koshi, I do not command him to attack. Rather, I loosen my grip on his reins and allow him to kill. He wants to hunt, to dominate to bathe himself in blood. Reproduction would also be a drive if such a thing were possible. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you were killed, Koshi would... What? Run amok? He chuckles. No, my friend, of course not. Koshi is not capable of storing any part of a human mind. He simply doesn't have the capacity for it. If I were to die, he would fall dormant, the same as any other drone. 
One day, perhaps I will perfect him, and a part of me will live on in his chassis after the meat of my body dies. But for now, I am satisfied to live with him as a combined entity, man and machine joined through a form of neural parabiosis into a single being. A beautiful first step into a post-human future. So he basically made himself a prototype to his theory. Hmm. I guess that if I have to know a mad scientist, I'm glad he's on my side. He snickers. <laughs> well said, my friend. And the feeling is mutual. If I must associate with violent criminals, I suppose that I'm happy to call them friends. Hmm. Okay, so you've rigged your drone to act as a home to your most destructive impulses. Impul I've got to ask, why? As a proof of concept, primarily. There are other advantages, of course. I shouldn't have to explain the value of a combat drone that wants to kill. Okay, tell me why you think we're going to beat the essence limit. You hinted at it before, but I want to know. I could do that. I've already shared quite a lot with you, and you haven't run off screaming. A good sign, I should think. He studies your face, peering at you through the gloom. But tell me, Sean, are you certain that you want to know? Some secrets are less pleasant than others. You might prefer to leave this stone unturned. Hmm. I want to know whatever you have to tell me, Raptor. I don't run from things because they're unpleasant. Very good. There are things that you don't know about me, my friend. Important things. <laughs> what kind of things? For one, I am not, how you put it, whole. What do you mean by that? There was a accident when I was young. A shop accident. I barely survived it. I am heavily cybered, my friend. You wouldn't know it because I keep my enhancements hidden. Others have found them disturbing in the past. How so? The enhancements themselves are not the problem. The extent of the damage that they were meant to correct, however, he sighs. That is a different matter. He uses the edge of his hand to trace a line across his hips. Everything below the mid-pelvis is replacement material. That's where I was sheared in half, you see. It's a miracle that I survived the experience. The blood loss alone should have killed me. But here I am, alive and well. Greatly improved, in point of fact. Whoa. You lost everything below the hit. Okay, that's... Yeah, you're saying you're half machine? Yes. The loss of so much tissue was traumatic, to be sure, as was the damage to my sense of personal identity. But it isn't so terrible as you might imagine. By every conceivable measure, I have been improved since the time of the accident. I am more than I was before, not less. But you lost half of your body. How could that not be terrible? He taps his temple with a finger. The doctors installed stimulus generators in my brain when they repaired me. With these, I can mimic the full range of sensations that the human body is capable of producing. Imagine the ramifications of such a thing. The things that you could do. The things that you could experience. The implications for operant conditioning alone are staggering. And so, yes, I have lost the entire lower half of my body. The full ramifications of such a loss are obvious. But in return, I have gained so much more. At will, I can goad my brain into producing whatever sensation I wish. I can poke at the wiring of my own consciousness, and I can reroute that wiring as I see fit. Alright, so you're half machine. What does this have to do with the essence limit? He spreads his arms. <laughs> Look at me, Sean. I have, shred of e I have a shred of essence left in me, and only barely that. But I suffer none of the ill effects associated with traumatic essence loss. How can that be? A quirk of psychology, long viewed as an illness, but never properly understood. What I now understand to be an evolutionary adaptation to a post-human future. We will conquer the essence limit. Given time. Natural selection will see to it. And I am the proof. These stimulus generators that, that you've been implanted with, how do they work? Uh, the technology is rather akin to SimSense, but considerably more powerful and flexible. Most SimSense experiences, those found in BTL chips for example, are structured around basic narratives that provide their users with context. But if you strip away the veneer of escapist fantasy, what you have left is an extremely powerful toolkit. Hmm. And what have you done with this toolkit? He shrugs. A little of this, a little of that. 
I have toyed with a number of my brain's basic neurochemical functions, stimulating the experience of peer bonding by stimulating the flow of oxy, uh, oxytoxin, for example, but I must be careful not to overstep my bounds. Reprogramming the brain is a risky endeavor, however great the temptation might be. Have you heard of anyone else who's gotten these implants? I certainly don't want them. I know of a handful of other recipients. From what I've heard, the others are all driven quite mad. To be handed control over the inner workings of one's own brain is a tremendous responsibility. He shrugs. Perhaps the others were well less equipped to handle it than I am. Hmm. Or maybe they've driven you insane too. Have you ever considered that possibility? Of course. Considered and rejected. The corner of his mouth curls into a wry smile. Granted, I could be wrong about that. Perhaps I am mad, but then, what would that say about you and your willingness to associate with me? Hmm. All this stuff that you told me about yourself, it's a lot to digest. <laughs> yes, my friend, I am sure that it is. Perhaps it would be best if you left. You have some processing to do, I think, and I would like the rest of the evening to myself. There is more to the story, of course, but nothing that can't wait till tomorrow. Sure, Rector. We'll talk tomorrow. Very good. Rest well. Interesting. So he's kind of a... a one-of-a-kind specimen. Speaking of which... Kaichu. Let's look through the box of mementos first. Chopsticks and a page. A pair of chopsticks with stained tips and a torn-out page from a book covered in Japanese writing. The chopsticks are a simple affair. Black lacquer, obviously cheap and mass-produced. Whatever reason Gaichu has for keeping them, it isn't their age or quality. Taking a closer look at the chopsticks, it becomes apparent that they have seen some rough use. The lacquer near the tips is chipped and flaked away, revealing the wood beneath. The wood itself is stained a dark brown as it encrust and is encrusted with something. Why did you keep these chopsticks? Gaichu burst into unexpected laughter, almost dropping his sword as he doubles over. He manages to gasp out a sentence after a long moment. Oh my goodness, I had forgotten those were in the box. He takes a few deep breaths, composing himself. Crazing his sword, Gaichu returns to his practice. Tell me, have you heard of Tetsura Nakamura? Is he somebody important? He was a member of Shiawasi's upper management for many years, running most of Shiawasi and Virotech's agricultural development. A very bright star in the corporate world. He died in 2052, and those chopsticks are what I killed him with. Chopsticks? Really? Those were the closest thing to a weapon I had at hand. Nakamura took his security very seriously and employed several highly augmented bodyguards. It was only through several months of extensive planning that we were able to get near him at all. When faced with a challenge, one is often forced to improvise with what is at hand. We had studied Nakamura's schedule painstakingly, particularly his twice-monthly trips to Neo-Tokyo. In Osaka, Shiawasi's presence would have made any attempt on his life functionarily impossible. In Neo-Tokyo, though... In studying his movement patterns, we discovered that he would eat at a particular French restaurant in Ginza every second trip, at precisely 8.30 in the evening. It seemed that he had a secret lover who lived in Rapongi, and he was visiting him during his business trips. Owing to this secrecy, he would give his bodyguards the night off when the two met. The restaurant in question was famous for its molecular gastronomy and the precision of their chefs, not to mention the view from the 38th floor. We managed to secure reservations near Nakamura's usual table, but only for two of us. It was decided that Sasaki and I would be the pair to kill Nakamura. Ashida and Amori would wait one floor below, and Takagawa would keep watch from a nearby skyscraper. We carried small but high-powered pistols as well as tactical knives. We expected it to be easy. So what went wrong? As I rose to draw my pistol on Nakamura, his lover somehow knew what was happening. He shrieked bloody murder and burst into flames. We discovered after the fact that he was a very powerful mage, but we haven't discovered this in our surveillance. Somehow, he managed to throw a barrier over the two of them that deflected my bullets. When I pulled my knife, it had turned red hot and I was forced to drop it. Sasaki engaged him in a contest of wills. I am not sure how that kind of magic works, but could not shatter his barrier. 
She was too busy dodging the lightning bolts he was throwing, and since the flames had set off the fire system, well, it was not easy. Nakamura broke and ran, and I pursued him. He had a small holdout pistol, a PB-120 or something similar, and I grabbed the nearest weapon I could find. Gaichu gestures towards you with the tip of his sword. Those chopsticks. I slid them up into his brainstem through the trachea. He died without making a sound, not that I would have been able to hear it over the sound of Amori's machine gun rattling away one floor below. Apparently the bodyguards were not truly given the night off and were still nearby. How did you get out? With the windows blown out, we fast roped down the side of the building and disappeared into the night. It was not the cleanest job, but it was very memorable. I still remember the smell, ozone and bechamel, mixed with the cordite and vivu... <laughs> that word. Okay, examine the page. The page is old, and the highly stylized calligraphy is handwritten. The style is so artistic, in fact, as to be functionally illegible to you. This page seems to be missing a book, Gaichu. Gaichu nods in agreement and steps forward to deliver a crosscut to the air in front of him. Yes, but that page is all I wanted from the book. I look out from the cloudless mountain at moonlight on the sea, its island so many rents in a sheet of ice. Gaichu pivots on the ball of his heel, thrusting the tip of his sword into the darkness of the room. The poet, the poet Saigyo. He was a master of conveying a sense of solitude and emptiness, and I have always found that poem to echo what I feel inside myself. How so? So often it feels as if I am contained within a ball of ice, floating through the void of this life, cold and solitary. The moments I can share with those that truly matter to me chip through that frost and let me scream out that I am not alone. He is very well written. All of these characters are, man. Let's see what Gaichu has to say himself. The cabin is silent aside from the occasional swish of air as Gaichu steps through sword forms. He holds each stance for a few seconds, practicing a given swing a few times before switching to the next. Hello, Sean. A single bead of sweat rolls down Gaichu's temple and he holds his position. After a few moments, he shifts to a relaxed stance, starting the new form again. I was not aware that ghouls sweated. Pardon me for continuing my exercises. I feel that I have been letting them slip of late. You worried you're getting rusty? No, that's not quite it. Rather, I wish to learn to bring my enhanced strength and speed to bear. In order to do so, I must ensure that my blind blindness does not hinder me. Perfection is a journey, not a destination. Gaichu lifts his sword, offering it edge first, tor first oh, offering it edge first towards you. Do you see that edge? Forged by one of the finest swordsmiths in modern Japan. Diamond-coated edge, capable of cutting even the most hardened ceramic armors. But what good is a sharpened edge without the precision to apply it? When I was still a man, I could have cu cut a single pea in half with my eyes closed. Oddly, after becoming blind, I cannot replicate this feat. Running the back of a claw along the blade's surface, Gaichu smiles thinly. I think soon I will be able to perform this feat again. I simply have to train my body to ignore the senses that it no longer has, and pay attention to the new ones. Now, what is it that you would like to discuss? And Gaichu wasn't with us on that last run. Has it been difficult to learn to fight while blind? It is not the easiest thing I have attempted, but neither is it the hardest. Placing the sword off to one side, Gaichu turns to face you. Emptiness is form is one of the great lessons of the Hakakure. Train sufficiently, and both swordsmanship and obedience will come instinctively. That is the closest to perfection a man can attain. Hmm. Well... Does that mean that in a perfect world you would have killed yourself when you got infected? If an order should be unjust or foolish, it should not be followed. To waste a skilled warrior as they would have by killing me is unacceptable. Obedience without a thought is to be cultivated, but so is the moral fortitude to know when to disagree. When I was new to the unit, I thought to be a good samurai was the ultimate goal, that to serve justly with dedication was the greatest honor a warrior could have. We were all young and foolish once, I suppose. Hmm... 
So what changed your mind? Beyond my disease? There was a fight in Fukuoka. My former team ambushed me. It had a singular effect on my worldview. We were taught that we were superior to everyone else. That since we were pure humans and Japanese, we would always win. I believe that most never questioned the validity of this claim, even when confronted with direct evidence to the contrary. Well, tell me about when your old unit ambushed you. Very well. Gaichu draws his nails over his scalp, sighing. My time there was tense. Since leaving Kihanshin, I had been careful to stay out of sight by moving on foot or on the back of automated delivery vans. I was running out of food, however, and needed to be in the city for that. It's just big enough to get lost in, but not so large that a ghoul sight sighting could go unnoticed. I hid in abandoned buildings and storm drainage systems, and for two weeks I managed to stay hidden. The strain of having to constantly move was wearing on me, however. I made a mistake. What happened? I had to get out of Japan, but all of my contacts here had come up empty-handed when I asked for a way to China. I was running low on money, and I could feel the team catching up with me. A contact of mine owed me a favor, and arranged passage for me if I could reach the city in 48 hours. Gaichu closes his eyes, resting his face in one palm. If I had taken my time, I could have made it to Kumamoto without incident, but I let caution slip when I got his email. I thought that if I disguised myself, I could take the train there, get out before my unit got any closer to finding me. I still don't know how they found me. Magical tracking, perhaps, or simply a well-developed spy network. Regardless, they found me. They are waiting for me at Hakata Station, and it was an ambush. What did they do? I had taken steps to disguise myself as best I could, relying on the sheer number of people to conceal my presence. I suspected that the team might attack while I was in public, but I did not realize just how expendable the civilians were. When they blew the C4 charges over the station's western entrance just to box me in, I realized how much I had underestimated them. Holy crap. I assumed that a train had derailed, honestly, but then I smelled the telltale acrid vapor of the explosives. Gaichu wrinkles his nose at the memory. Once you smell it, you never forget. The plastic explosive that we used has a particularly sharp odor, like old cheese. Something to do with an olfactory tangent added to the help track it if it's stolen. I remember stumbling through the dust and debris, trying to find my way to the rail platforms. They attacked from all sides, using the confusion to strike at once. I could hear Ishida and Takagawa behind me. Amori and Sasake charged out of an access corridor just ahead of where I had been standing. Sasake threw a firewall down behind me, cutting off retreat while Amore started firing. Hmm. That's a nasty situation to be caught in. One of the worst. Confined space, facing a mage and a heavy gunner. Those are losing odds, even if the attackers were ordinary mercenaries. I did the only thing I could think of. I charged Amori and Sasaki. They were only 15 meters away from me. The only advantage I had was that they were as blinded by the dust as I was, but I could still hear and smell them. Sasake threw a lightning bolt at me, but I managed to roll under it. As I came up, Amori's light machine gun was swiveling down. I felt time stretch out as I stared down the barrel. I caught Amori in the throat with the tip of my sword. It was a maneuver I'd practiced hundreds of, hundreds of times before. There was no resistance as I cut through his trachea, and he fell as I rolled to the side. I could hear him choking for breath as he dropped. Gaichu exhales a humorless laugh and shakes his head. <laughs> it is strange to think how clear that memory is. Even now. Hmm. Well, when the adrenaline is pumping, you form memories with more clarity. Certainly, that is true. But I remember that strike so clearly for an entirely different reason. It was in that strike that I realized who I truly was. What did it mean that I, an infected monster that was less than a beast, could still defeat the finest soldiers in the world? Red Samurai Doctrine taught Amori and the others not to fear me, and this overconfidence would be their death. I realized I had progressed beyond their ability to understand. My sword was as accurate as ever, but they could not account for it due to ideological blindness. Hmm. 
Well, that's the danger of letting ideology overrule facts. Precisely. All those years, I was worried I was not good enough to be a member of the Red Samurai. That somehow they had been, had, they have been pulling my weight. But I had been blind to all the ways in which we were not training, or I had avoided the harsh truths about our own abilities. We were so often told of our own excellence that I wondered if we had ever truly been tested. Sasake was the next to fall. As I turned away from Amori, I realized she must have seen me strike him. Her eyes were wide, and I could feel her fear and anger as she tried to summon another spell. She seemed caught between healing Amore and attacking me. Gaichu taps himself on the forehead just above his right eye. It was there on Sasake, a downward stroke from Jordan's stance. Or Jodan's stance. She had hesitated, just as Amore had. I felt the breath go out of her, like someone had deflated a tire. She just slid down into a pile. I think she was trying to ask me how, when I ran. What about Ishida and Takagawa? My goal was survival, not victory. Takagawa was too far away, and I did not see Ishida. I only smelt him. So I ran. The trains had been shut down due to the explosion, but as long as I could get out of Hakata Station, I knew I could escape. They did not follow me into the city proper. From what I heard via the Matrix, the event was reported as a terrorist attack that was thwarted by brave Renraku soldiers. Gaichu snorps, snorts, lips curling downward. Brave, foolish soldiers. Hmm. So if you kill two of them, why are they still hunting you? Gaichu does not answer immediately. He seems uneasy with the question, fidgeting with his fingers. I am unsure why that would make a difference. Can you explain what you are driving at? Hmm. If you train with your unit so extensively, won't it be impossible to replace the ones you killed? Ah, I see. I think your mistake is in seeing this from a practical perspective. The problem is emotional, not mechanical. Folding his arms over his chest, Gaichu continues to explain. The nature of Red Samurai assignments is such that losses are generally zero, or the entire team. In those rare cases when Red Samurai teams suffer partial losses, the remnants of the impacted teams are shuffled together and undergo retraining. Sasake and Amori will undoubtedly be replaced. The problem is that I cannot be replaced. Simply put, I am not dead. Ordinarily, a missing Red Samurai would be considered dead for purposes of reorganizing teams, but Renraku knows precisely what has happened to me. What's more, my failure to do my duty reflects badly on the unit. Others will undoubtedly resist joining my former squad as it's been tainted. Alright, now I see why they won't stop hunting you. It's a matter of honor. Exactly. Until they can remove the stain on their honor, they are unable to move forward. I have trapped them in the past, and they feel that the only recourse is to take my life. Gaiju spreads his hands helplessly. This is the trap of their duty. They have hunted me in Japan, Shanghai, and Beijing, and now I am certain they will hunt me here in Hong Kong. The cycle will continue endlessly for the foreseeable future. Such is the way of things. Hmm. Wouldn't it be easier if you faced them down, rather than run? How do you mean? I have faced them several times in the past. In Shanghai? Unless you have a deeper meaning I am aware of, I have already done as you suggest. Hmm. Well, you're capable of striking back at them. Why aren't more of them dead? Gaichu's expression darkens and he folds his arms over his chest. You think our battles have not been in earnest? You believe that I should have been more efficient in defending myself? Hmm. Well, I think it's. I guess we can go ahead and just say it. Hmm. You define yourself by your opposition to your old life. What? Blinking a few times, Gaichu leans closer to you. I am unsure that I clearly understand your meaning. Can you explain yourself more clearly? Think about it. You get to live as the Ronin Red Samurai, unfairly cast out by his unit. Ah, and you believe that absent that opposition, I would have little to define myself. That is a very cheap philosophy, Sean. 
and unworthy of you. Okay, prove me wrong. Who are you without your unit? Drawing himself up and puffing out his chest, Gaichu glares at you. You tell me. What do you see? I am the creature that stands in front of you. What is it that I am, in your opinion? Hmm. Uh, that's, that's a cop-out answer, and you know it. And your assistance upon labels is a weakness. Why must you name a thing in order to understand it? You claim I am nothing without my unit, yet you cannot answer a simple question. I am, I exist. That is the truth and some total of meaning in it. There exists no objective, external force to impose meaning and value upon our lives. How I choose to survive is a facet of my life, but it is not the totality of it. I seek to perfect myself, my skills, and my abilities in combat. Perhaps this is not the path I would have walked when I was younger, but I have been a soldier for so long that I cannot imagine devoting myself to any other trade. This does not mean I am tied inexplicably to my unit. It simply means I am shaped by my history, as are we all. I appreciate your concern about my history and my unit, but I assure you, I am doing all right. I must learn to adapt to my new condition and lifestyle on my own. The time will come when they find me in Hong Kong. Hmm. What does perfecting yourself mean to you anyway? I do not know. I am certain that sounds like an evasion, but it is not. There is no road map for being a ghoul who is also a freelance killer. I only know that my instincts are stronger now than they were when I was an ordinary man. Because of this, I must learn to make my own way in this world. There is no older teaching for me to reach for. Gaichu suddenly cocks his head. Is this why you're concerned about my history with the Red Samurai? Hmm. Of course, I want you to make the most of your new life. Gaichu blinks several times, his surprise evident. That is remarkably kind of you, Sean. Were this a year or more ago, I would not believe you. After seeing how you handled the Wampoans, however, I do. I am no longer simply a man. This is a fact of my life. I am beyond that. I do not know if I am better for it, but I know that I am different for it. The fact that I am different, however, cannot be denied. I put a question to you, then. If you had been changed into a ghoul, what would you do? How would you improve yourself and learn to live with your condition? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I forget for everyone needs to be human. I'm not human. Um. Hmm. I have no idea. That's a road I can't even consider. I've never been in your position. A fair point. And that is why I struggle with it. I know that I must eat or what I must eat, how I must live. The changes are not only physical, as I mentioned before. My mind is more instinctive now, and reasoning is more difficult. I tend to react quickly, without thought, but that also generally will turn the tide in my favor. Gaichu squares himself, nodding several times of agreeing with his own internal dialogue. Warriors must learn to push their body and soul to the utmost limit. So too it is with me, but my body and soul are no longer that of a man. I must learn to use these differences as an advantage rather than a handicap. Perfection is not a destination. It is a journey. One must strive to become the purest form of oneself that one can be. So what will you do about your unit when they come looking for you in Hong Kong? I am unsure. You've given me a great deal to consider, and I do not mean that lightly. There are several actions and possible outcomes I foresee. I could, as I have before, relocate to another city, flee Hong Kong, travel to somewhere further afield, Lagos perhaps, or Montreal. It would have to be some place where Renraku's influence was minimal, and where the unit's presence would be immediately noticeable. This has been my plan of action in the past. I could also keep a low profile, staying here, hope that they are unable to find precisely where I am hiding. Undoubtedly, Ashida would command the team to keep looking. I believe it would only be a matter of time before they found me, but if it were a sufficiently long time, they might be recalled. I could also confront them, drawing them out into open at a time and place of my choosing. They are nothing if not predictable in their efforts to follow Red Samurai operational doctrine. That plan could succeed, but it could also put you and civilians at risk. 
I am unsure how I would draw them out in the first place. Hmm. You need to find a way to fight them. We need to get hit this situation handled. Gaichu sighs, shoulders slumping a little. I am unsure if that is the wisest course of action. I am going to need to think about this a great deal. Please, let me think on this. I will have an answer later. Sure thing. I'll talk to you later. Alright. Lots of interesting plot developments here with our crew, especially these two gentlemen. But in the next episode, we will talk to Iso and Gobbit, and then I think we're going to do Iso's mission and try and get that going. But I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you liked the episode, go ahead and click like down below, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, that'd be a big help, and we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.